from the dam. So all the water came rushing out and drowned all of the commons who were encamped below. <laughs> sadly, of course, sadly, of course, the brave Macintosh clansman also drowned. But he was a hero nonetheless. Well, every family needs a martyr. <laughs> oh, they do. Such fierce loyalty among the clans made them a formidable foe. But the dominance of the clan system came to an end on this field in 1746. Culloden was the last battle on British soil. It pitted the redcoats of the Duke of Cumberland against the Highlanders of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Imagine how those clansmen felt in the Jacobite army as they drew their claymores and looked towards the government army. The government army was disciplined, it was organised, it had artillery. All the Highlanders had was their charge. And when the chief gave the word of command to charge, they went forward, charging for all they could. Ah! But at the end of the battle, it was a tragedy for all of them. They were defeated, and those that survived and were lying in the ground, crying out for help, were butchered. The bloody Jacobite rebellion terrified King George and his government. Impregnable defences were built in the Highlands to suppress any future uprising. Fort George, close to Culloden, was the strongest bastion in a string of forts that stretched throughout the Great Glen. It demonstrated England's determination that no Scottish army would ever invade again, which had been happening for more than a thousand years. This church was one of the targets of the invading Scots. Cartmel Priory in the Lake District had the misfortune of being close to the historic invasion route. The wealth of the Priory Church here at Cartmel attracted tremendous greed. Indeed, my ancestor, King Robert the Bruce, sacked this place twice in the 14th century on his way down to the south. But the wealth also brought great responsibilities for the monks who prayed here in these stalls. They were responsible for everybody in this community. And one of their tasks was to ensure that those people were safe when they crossed Morecambe Bay, very nearby. And for over 700 years now, an appointment has existed called the Guide over Kent Sands. What sort of tides can you get here? Well, this morning, should, it is one of the highest tides of the year. But... Cedric Robinson has lived on the shore of Morecambe Bay all his life. 35 years ago, Queen Elizabeth made him Guide over Kent Sands. It's been a royal appointment since the 16th century. Morecambe Bay covers an area of 120 square miles. At low tide, the bay looks like an easy shortcut between Cumbria and Lancaster, but when the tide turns, the water rushes in like an express train and would cover the tractor. A wall of water known as the bore heralds the return of the tide. It's the force of the currents that scours out the mud and leaves dangerous pockets of quicksand. Cedric and his predecessors learnt to read these signs, marking out the safe route with branches of laurel leaves. Oh, it's a little bit soft there, a little bit quick sandy. You can see how they blow bubbles of it, see there? Yeah. Water, there's water underneath. Mind you, if you stayed there long enough and you worked on it, you would go down. I can feel, I can feel yeah. it starting to pull on my boots. Uh, uh, look at it go down. Yeah, and it's filled with sand. Let's see. But... Oh my goodness, look at that. It goes right down. See that? It's only... Gosh, I can feel it's already pulling yeah. at mine. Yeah, see? So oh, you, you yeah. would soon, soon lose your weight. Yeah, it certainly would. In there, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah, it certainly would. It so feels so strong. Yeah. feels so strong now, and then yeah. off it goes. Yeah. We'll lose the other willies. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. A person sometimes may be able to walk over an area of sand, but a horse would... the, the, the crust would break, just crack, and, and down, down a horse would go. And I've seen two horses go down in quicksand in my lifetime on the sands. I've seen several tractors disappear within seconds. It's interesting to think that more than 600 years ago, my ancestor was guided over this bay by Cedric's predecessor. It's beautiful, really, and, and, and it's enticing, isn't it, on a fine day, the sunshine and... Well, and nice. standing here, I want to go straight across it. Yeah. And I can understand why Robert the Bruce wanted to go straight across it in the 14th century with his whole army because yeah. he saw 
There's Lancaster. Yeah. Heavens, let's just go straight over. That's true. It's, it's a shortcut. In those days, the roads around, there were, you know, highways as they called them. Uh, there was no bridges. A lot of the rivers, you know, had to ford the rivers. And so by look, looking across this estuary on a, on, a, on a fine day, you know, it almost looks if you could throw a stone across and hit the other side. So they did, they did cross the sands a lot of people, but by gum, it was dangerous in those early days. But they say that Robert the Bruce came to find your predecessor to get <laughs> the guide to show him across. Yeah, yeah. Aye. The guide's appointment is vital but humble. We've come to see something that's trivial but very grand indeed. These are the gates to the home of the hereditary Grand Carver of England. And the Earl of Denby's family claims the right to cut the meat at the Sovereign's coronation banquet. Uh, the basis, I believe, is uh, the 6th and 7th Earl uh, performed the duties for uh, the coronation of George III and the Fourth. How do you think the Denbys got the job? Uh, we've always been very good as a family at covering our backs. Uh, we either seem to have been fighting on the right side or marrying the right daughters. What chances do you get to be a carver? Uh, a Sunday carver. Uh, I learned really through dinner parties for friends and uh, they got very well fed and I got a lot of practice. Uh, I think it is inherently part of England or part of Britain. Uh, it's a marvellous piece of sort of the pomp and circumstance that people associate with this country. Uh, and it's a shame to see traditions going away. I've come to Addington Palace, south of London, to help recreate history in a cooking pot. There's been a house at Addington since William the Conqueror's time. The present palace was once a summer residence of the Archbishops of Canterbury. These days, it's a leisure centre, and more interestingly, a fine restaurant. And this is the famous dish of Addington, the mess of Dillygrat. What's in it? Well, we start off um, with a brawn of uh, pig's head. Pig's, pig's head. head? Sure, pig's head was very... Today, chef Simon Rogan will be taking us back in time to the coronation of George IV in 1821. History has repeated itself, for the Doomsday Book records that the king's cook, Tezelin, was lord of the manor.